Hi, I'm Ricky DeRiz and welcome to the Mind That Ego podcast. Today, I'm joined by Steve Taylor. Steve is a senior lecturer in psychology at the Leeds Beckett University and the author of several best-selling books on psychology and spirituality. These include Back to Sanity, The Leap, Spiritual Science, and his new book, Extraordinary Awakenings, When Trauma Leads to Transformation. His books have been published in 20 languages, whilst his articles and essays have been published in over 100 academic journals, magazines, and newspapers. Eckhart Tolle has described his work as an important contribution to the shift in consciousness, which is happening on our planet at present. So Steve, welcome to the show. Hi Ricky, great to be with you. Um, I, I'd like to begin at first by thanking you for, for making the time to, to come on the show. Um, You're welcome. It's, it's been a while that I've, I've been familiar with your work. And when I first discovered your work, it was really uplifting to see your approach. I think it's an approach that's really, really necessary for the times that we live in, bringing together the psychology and, and the spirituality, um, as well as a scientific backdrop to these extraordinary experiences. I'd like to begin by maybe understanding what drew you to the field of transpersonal psychology, um, as well as an explanation of transpersonal psychology for those that aren't so familiar with the field. It really came from my own experiences when I was younger, when I was 16, 17 years old. I, I was quite depressed at that time. I felt quite alienated and, um, and you know, quite severely depressed. And, but every so often I'd have these kind of uplifting experiences. They often happened when I was walking in a natural surrounding, like, like in a park or on my school fields. Um, I suddenly feel uplifted. I feel I suddenly felt connected to my surroundings and the natural phenomena around me was seen more alive somehow as if, they, as if they were sentient. And the sky would be sort of filled with this sense of, it's very difficult to describe, but a sort of sense of radiance or a feeling of harmony. So I didn't really understand those experiences at the time. I thought they, they sort of provided more evidence than I was crazy. And I didn't tell anybody about them because, you know, my parents would have, they were probably quite close to sending me to a psychiatrist anyway. So that would have been the final, they would have definitely sent me. Um, so I had the good sense not to tell anybody about them. But um, it was only probably about five years later when I was 21, 22, I discovered a book about mysticism. It was called Mysticism, a Study and an Anthology by a guy called F.C. Happold, a scholar of mysticism. And it was basically an anthology of myst mystical experiences reports of mystical experiences or spiritual experiences and when I read those I thought wow these are a bit like the experiences I've been having you know so you know maybe I'm not crazy after all maybe you know maybe maybe I'm crazy but all of these other people are crazy too you know so there's a tradition of craziness <laughs> so, but anyway it, it made me feel you know more at home with myself it gave me a, a kind of context to make sense of my own experiences and after that I, you know, I was, I was just, you know, I was, I was, I was off, you know, I was, I was, I was exploring this new field of spirituality, reading as many spiritual books as I could, going to meetings and talks. And it was great because I, I suddenly had this framework to make sense of myself and identified as a spiritual seeker, which I was. And yeah, I was really trying to make sense of my own experiences, but I was doing other things at that time. I was a musician back then. Um, but, but, T Ten years later or so, when my musical career was sort of ignominiously failed, I decided to, you know, to, I started to think about you know, these experiences. And I'd always been interested in philosophy and psychology as well as spirituality. So I, I discovered by chance, I was reading a book by Ken Wilber. And it was the first book, but it was the first time that I'd ever seen the term, read the term transpersonal psychology. And I thought, what is transpersonal psychology? I thought this sounds like something I, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm interested in. So I read more about it. And I thought, wow, this is this is fantastic. So transpersonal psychology is basically um, the study of spirituality or spiritual experiences from a psychological perspective. And I realized that that was what I'd, I, I'd been sort of gravitating towards. I'd already started to write articles and essays on, on that theme. So it, it was a field where, where I naturally felt at home. And I discovered there was a master's degree in Liverpool, quite close to where I lived, 
um, transpersonal psychology. And as soon as I got involved with it, I felt I felt this marvelous sense of homecoming uh, that mm. I was where I was meant to be. So I did a PhD and became a university lecturer. And you know, I still feel that sense of being exactly where I'm supposed to be. You use the word context, which I feel is so powerful to to be able to contextualize these experiences and this balance between you know sanity and insanity and how a worldview can shift that that understanding like if you have a different worldview you're sane or you're insane dependent on that um these these experiences for you is there a a way that you would you would define an awakening experience Uh, you mentioned like the sentience of the sky and this kind of real heightened awareness so there are other qualities that you find to be the case with with an awakening experience Yes, um, I, I would define an awakening experience in simple terms as an expansion and intensification of awareness. So that, but that can involve different kinds of awareness. It can involve perceptual awareness, which is kind of the most obvious thing when the world around you changes and becomes more real and more beautiful. That's the kind of experience I had most, you know, um, most prevalently. But it, it can also be an expansion of awareness in terms of your own being, like going more deeply into your own being. Um, For example, if you're in a a state of meditation, you go really deeply into yourself and you discover a kind of new reality inside yourself. You discover new depths of your being and you discover a sense of oneness within your own being. So, but it can also be an expansion of awareness in, in terms of a connection to other people and other living beings and the natural world as a whole. So awakening experiences are often characterized by a feeling of connection to other people, to nature, to the universe as a whole. Um, and the, or, or you could think of that in terms of a transcendence of separation. Awakening experiences are, you know, largely about that. I would say they're largely about transcending a sense of separation. I, I read, I, I loved in um, in spiritual science when you, you articulated so well this this idea of at some point in our evolution and i believe you talk about this in the leap as well it's almost as if the ego has has been constructed and it's through that construction that we've solidified like a, a sense of individuality and maybe it's been necessary for some advancements in in science but that's led to that that sense of separation and maybe a dimming of what could be a, a normal uh, kind of perception to be able to experience oneness um, away from the ego. Mm. That's right. I, I think what we, what we consider a normal state of consciousness is actually subnormal. I think there's something deeply mm-hmm. wrong with the normal way we perceive the world. And when we have these awakening experiences, we're actually you know, seeing the world in a, a truer, more fundamental way. It's as if our normal state of consciousness is a kind of aberration, it's a kind of mistake, um, in, in that we feel this illusory sense, we experience this illusory sense of separation, and we live in this very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Very kind of, well, on, on the one hand, it's a very narrow experience of self, you know, this feeling of being cut off from the world around us. And the world around us, the phenomenal world that we live in, becomes so familiar that it almost becomes unreal you know it's this kind of half real shadowy reality that we live in but in awakening experience it's like wow you know suddenly there's this brightness and freshness to things suddenly things become more interesting more real more beautiful and there's always a sense of wow this is the way things really are so it's as if we're kind of slipping outside this slightly aberrational state and seeing things as they really are or at least closer to how they really are. One thing I, I'd, I'd like to explore is, so this is also from my experience of awakening, um, the perception shift wasn't one of the first things to happen. I went through a dark night of the soul for a very long time before, but that for me was, was an elevation that deeply reconnected me to what we would conventionally call the material. Um, because I went through a spell of, of having a going through poor mental health. And the word that I, I use uh, in my book and, and generally when I talk is disenchantment and going mm. through a spell of being like, I am separate. There's no real inherent meaning in existence. Um, 
there's no real meaning in suffering and feeling very isolated and cut off and and um nihilistic almost and I kind of went through this this stage and it was later on where I went down the kind of transcendent route and was exploring like meditation and that inward connection that you talk of but there's something in it for me this this alivening of of the earthly that feels it just feels for me it feels right as as a direction to move in and mm. the exploration and, and something that I've noticed it it feels bi-directional it feels like there's a communication between me and the sky or me and and what I'm experiencing is that something you could talk to in in terms of an experience yes yes I, I feel the same especially when I you know I feel it in quite a strong way if I walk in a forest or in the woods there's a sense that it's not just me who's kind of connecting mm. the nature around me is connecting to me as well I always feel like trees are are sentient beings and they're somehow connecting to me as well but yeah I, I feel the same you know in the in terms of if I look at the sky on a clear night you, know, you see the enormity of space and the, the stars yeah it's very difficult to describe but there's a feeling that they're sort of connecting with me as well but I, I think that's because connection is a fundamental reality everything mm. really is one Everything comes from the same source. I think of it in terms of, in, in spiritual science, I use the term fundamental consciousness. I think the essential reality of the universe is fundamental consciousness, or you could call it spirit, if you like. Um, and spirit has this kind of radiant quality. People who have near-death experiences or mystical experiences often speak of this translucent, translucent light, which is so blinding, so, so, so kind of incredibly bright right but it doesn't blind them or hurt their eyes and I think they're they're really touching into fundamental consciousness and they often say that it seems as though this light is the source of creation you know the place where everything comes from and I think in a sense that's true I think everything comes from this fundamental consciousness and therefore everything is interconnected everything is pervaded with the same spiritual force and in mystical or awakening experiences we can experience that we can touch into that that oneness and it's a realization that we share our being with everybody else and with the whole world yeah that's beautiful i think this this undercurrent this is something i'd like to to go into in terms of the the scientific in a bit this undercurrent of, of connection and oneness um which seems to be a, a fundamental aspect of, of awakening into through, through these experiences. I, I would like to look at it in a bit more detail, the, um, the power of transformation. So with your new book, Extraordinary Awakenings, you know, a lot of people associate a spiritual awakening, maybe through spiritual practice, like direct spiritual practices, such as meditation, maybe something spontaneous. Um, there's also, uh, maybe a cliche of um, like po hyper positivity with, with awakening. And, and we see a lot on like social media now has been commodified slightly, maybe not even slightly, maybe a lot. Um, <laughs> could you talk to the, the, you mentioned like the, the light, it's just this, this translucent light, but then also the, the shadow aspect of when trauma does lead to an awakening and what you've discovered through that research. That's, um, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a strong theme of my research. Only accidentally, I just kept, when I was researching uh, awakening experiences, which are usually temporary, I kept, kept finding cases of people who had not just had a temporary experience. They, they kept telling me, oh, you know, it, wasn't, it didn't really fade away. It, it stayed. You know, it wasn't as intense, but on a lower level, it became my normal state. You know, and I feel like a different person now, and everything has changed since then. So I kept coming up on these cases of, permanent transformation and they were almost always in people who had been through long periods of intense trauma people who'd had a bereavement people who'd been diagnosed with cancer people who'd been through a long period of addiction or depression and so on so I realized that it was a phenomenon in itself that I needed to investigate so I started to investigate it more and more and I kept finding more and more cases I realized it was quite prevalent and I 
it took me a while to, to I, I thought long and hard about what is actually happening here? Why are these people undergoing transformation uh, in these moments of intense suffering? What is actually going on? <clears throat> and the best way of explaining it, uh, in my view, was in terms of a, a dissolution of the ego, first of all, because when, when we go through intense suffering, it, it often has an ego dissolving effect. You know, the ego either can't stand the pressure, so it mm. collapses, you know, like a house in an earthquake, or the ego is slowly dismantled because there's a long period of loss in which a person's identity slowly breaks down. Um, I, I think of that in terms of psychological attachments that slowly, over a long period of depression or addiction, the person's psychological attachments gradually dissolve away their attachment to possessions, to success, to status, to ambitions. Um, beliefs, knowledge, and so forth, it all gradually gets lost. So then, then there's this process of ego dissolution, which is normally a painful experience, which brings even more suffering. But in some people, it wasn't just a question of ego dissolution. It was also a question of a new self arising inside them. So the ego would die, and a new self would arise inside them and replace the ego. And that would become their normal self. And it was always this, um, this kind of higher self, this naturally spiritually awakened self, which had this um, a feeling of connection, a feeling of well-being, a um, feeling of appreciation, and so forth. All of the qualities that, that come in temporary spiritual experiences, but were kind of, they were established as ongoing traits. So, yeah, it's, um, you know, it's, it, it is a common phenomenon. And it's a, it's a very remarkable phenomenon. Makes me think of the Rumi uh, quote, the wounds are where the light comes in or the wounds are where the light enters. Something along those lines. Not sure if you're familiar with that. Uh, yeah, that's quote. right. Yeah, there's another great one from Kahil, Khalil Gabran mm. from the prophet. He mm -hmm. says, if I remember rightly, the deeper, the deeper that suffering enters into you, the more space there is for joy to fill you or something like that. Yeah, which is, this is so against the conventional grain of, of the avoidance of suffering at all costs and you know, hyper distraction, uh, even, mm. even, even in the face of things like boredom, let alone like psychological trauma, but even with, you know, um, feelings of unrest can, can cause people to want to kind of run away from that. I think that's, that's it. Right. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's entirely natural that human beings should want to avoid suffering. It's, it would seem kind of perverse if we, you know, purposely inflicted <laughs> suffering. A lot, a lot of Christian ascetics did that. You know, they were sort yeah. of, they would wear belts with nails and mm. hair shirts, things like that. But I mean, yeah. in a way, people do it. I mean, people do put themselves to quite, you know, to extreme. I'm thinking of things like extreme sports where people flirt with death mm -hmm. in order to. I mean, in a sense, it's the same thing that they're trying to inflict trauma on themselves really so that they can shift into a higher state of consciousness yeah i i think there's i can't remember exactly what it is but abraham maslow talks about i think it was maslow this this balance this balance between being willing to embrace suffering but not if it becomes masochistic if you're like looking for suffering that's like a kind of um the other side of the scale but to be able to yeah. embrace it with, with a structure and a context that is supportive. Yeah, that, that's very wise because I'm not, I'm not saying that we should purposely seek out suffering, but it, it is going to arise in our lives. Mm. You know, at some point we're all going to face trauma. You know, we're going to face bereavement. You know, our parents are going to get old and we're going to need to care for them. And that's going to be mm. stressful and challenging. You know, all, all kinds of things can happen. Natural disasters can occur. So we have to be prepared to face suffering in the right way. And it does have a lot of transformational potential. So, you know, I suggest in the book that, you know, we should approach suffering in the right way in order, in order to harness that transformational potential. So with, I think for a lot of people as well, like the... Um, I was th also think going back to a, a asceticism, a Buddha was another prime example of someone that went to that extreme and then found the middle way through, through that approach. So it seems like a, that golden mean of balance is, 
is crucial when integrating suffering. And it's almost like these awakening experiences are, are a symbol or a reminder of the potential of that joy that can come through suffering. Um, it, with that, I feel like it, it's also not supported in a, a conventional worldview. So just to define that, like a conventional worldview is like the material worldview that, that we're used to wouldn't necessarily support this idea of joy being like beyond pain. Mm -hmm. um, is that because that seems to be a theme in the work and, and with near death experiences as well. There's a, an experience of bliss. I know it's referred to in different traditions like Hinduism and, and Buddhism that you can you can almost get through this pain into something else. Uh, how would you, you talk more to that? Um, the experience of like peace or joy that that comes beyond uh, suffering? They, you know, suffering and joy, they don't seem to be opposites. Going back to Abraham Maslow, he used the term, he, he was famous for using the term peak experiences, but he also used the term nadir experiences, mm -hmm. which is when you, you know, experiences of desolation, the kind of experiences we've been talking about. And he, he realized that nadir experiences and peak experiences are not opposites, they're actually interlinked. So a near, a near experience can frequently give rise to a peak experience. And in, yeah, in some strange way, the kind of duality between them collapses. And you just need to sort of switch over. It's like the other side of a coin. You suddenly switch over from desolation into a state of freedom. And I think the key to it is the ego. I think suffering and trauma can break down the ego. But when the ego breaks down, it can be... A, set of, a feeling of liberation you know the, the ego the kind of constricted state of consciousness we were just discuss, discussing earlier our normal aberrational state of consciousness which encloses in this kind of half real world that 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 is dependent on the ego it's created by the ego so when the ego dissolves then we're suddenly out of that world we're suddenly in a much more real world you know in a much more um a much more expansive world, much more beautiful world. So that, that's, I think that's the key to understanding the link between um, suffering and, and joy. Suffering is, is a, a gateway. I'm not saying it's the only gateway. Mm. People sometimes say to me, are you saying that we have to suffer in order to gain spiritual awakening? But no, it's, it's just one, one gateway. Yeah, it makes me, um, makes me think of a, a Bhagavad Gita quote that... Um, the spiritual path is bitter poison in the beginning and sweet nectar in the end. I think it mm. certainly seems necessary to, to, you mentioned attachments to kind of work with the psychological trauma or, or ways in which with the conventional worldview of, of the material, a lot of people look for fulfillment through material means. You speak about this um, in your book as well, like the desire to acquire things or, or find purpose in the out there because that seems to be where where everything else is um th it's interesting you mentioned the, the two sides to the coin i feel like it's a really nice segue into it feels like there are there are potential worldviews two sides of the same coin and you speak to this in spiritual science you have the conventional material worldview and then you suggest the the pan Pan spiritist, is that right? Pan, mm -hmm. pan spiritual, pan spiritist worldview. Yeah. And that, like those two sides can completely reframe almost every experience from insanity to sanity and from, you know, suffering to joy. Hmm. Could you explain a bit more about the, the material worldview and then this, this alternative? A lot of people don't realize that the standard secular worldview in our culture is a kind of belief system. And you know, you can refer to it as materialism. Sometimes people call it physicalism, <clears throat> but it's a belief system which is ingrained into us through our, through our education system, through our parents, through our peers, through the media. And I'm, I'm not talking in terms of some kind of conspiracy. It's, it's just kind of, it's the worldview which the intelligence here in our culture have accepted as reality. It, it, probably, it probably established itself in Europe towards the end of the 19th century after Darwin's theory of evolution. Uh, once religion began to the influence of religion began to wane so the, the religious worldview was no longer tenable 
So we adopted a different worldview, which is basically that matter is the fundamental reality. Matter and physical forces are the fundamental reality of the world. And everything can be explained in terms of the interaction of material particles. So one strong assumption of materialism is that consciousness is produced by the brain. So, and your sense of identity is produced by brain, the brain. So everything you are is basically the result of um, neurological firings and neural firings in your brain. And it's the same, you know, there's no, you know, life is a purely biological phenomenon. There's no such thing as a soul or spirit. And when we die, obviously there will be no life after death because our brain will stop functioning. Therefore our conscious and identity will stop functioning. Everything can be explained in terms of um, genes and um, um, neurological activity. So these are kind of these are the assumptions of the materialistic worldview. So I think another assumption is that there's no such thing as altruism because human beings are essentially selfish uh, genetic machines. So we're only really concerned with our own survival and uh, reproduction when our genes get replicated. So everything we do is motiv motivated by those factors. So it makes no sense for us to be genuinely uh, generous or kind to other people because there's no benefit, or there might be some benefit to ourselves, but there's certainly there's no kind of pure altruism. So that, that's, you know, in, in spiritual science, I actually list all the, the kind of tenets of the materialist belief system. I think I list about 10. Mm. But when you, when you, but if you actually look into it, a lot of the assumptions of the materialist belief system are, well, there's there's very little evidence for them there's very actually very little evidence that consciousness is produced by the brain it's quite a problematic assumption when you look into it and so what, what i do in the book is i suggest that there is an alternative worldview which i call panspiritism which is that uh, the fundamental reality of the universe is not matter but consciousness or spirit and i suggest that if you begin with that um that you begin from that basis then a lot of things, a lot of aspects of human experience are much easier and much more satisfactorily explained, like consciousness, altruism, the effect on the, of the mind, on the body, as in the placebo effect. Mm -hmm. And you can also explain <clears throat> near-death experiences, spiritual experiences, even psi phenomena, and so forth. So it's a much more satisfactory worldview than materialism. This uh, there are so many <laughs> so many routes that we can go down with this. It's such a rich a rich area to explore. I know you mentioned and and it is clear that even when you talk right, you present these these alternatives, uh, alternate views. And maybe this is my own bias, but when you when you talk about it, like the material worldview, like, part of me starts to 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 shrink a bit. I feel a bit like oh, really? Like I, it's like <laughs> a, an embodied feeling of no, that doesn't feel right. And when you talk about the more expansive worldview, it feels like, yeah, that, that makes sense. And I know a big thing for me when I was growing up is so interesting that now I'm really into spirituality and I and have like my practice and your work amongst many others working in, in the field and, and bringing the science into it was like, wow. Not only was I, I was elated and, and I felt like, wait, why is no one, why is no one talking about this? There's a whole, there's so many people that are exploring this, you know, there's so much science behind mm. it. There's so many leading thinkers that oppose this view, but you know, most people, they're not aware of it because it's not part of the, um, the state's quo with that for me came a feeling of anger almost in mm. that I denied and invalidated my own experiences because the world you didn't fit. And I linked being intellectual with this material kind of yeah. quote unquote rational. Um, and I even, my, my mom and my sister remind me of this. Like I used to kind of shut them down if they spoke of like telepathy and stuff like that, but no, there's no evidence for it. <laughs> mm, <laughs> I just became yeah. this kind of like cynical intellect before it's awakening and then discovered the huge amounts of, of um, wealth of, of research and, and evidence to yeah. look at a more expansive view. Mm, that's really interesting because I was the same in a way. I kind of imbibed this materialist worldview from my education, from my peers as well. 
And then, the only way I could respond to it was by, be, by becoming an existentialist. Mm. I, thought, I thought of myself as an existentialist, which, you know, existentialists assume that there is no life after death, that all we have is this, this life now. But it, there's a kind of positive aspect to it because it insists that you are free, you know, nothing really means anything. So you're free to create your own meaning and you're free to kind of rejoice that life is so temporary and it's, it's precious, even though it doesn't really mean, any, mean anything in the end. So, well, eventually I realized that existentialism just didn't fit with my experience. You know, uh, there was something inside me that, that always felt that, this, that there was more to the world than what we see through our senses. You know, I, I've always sort of, I've always suspected that there is some, some form of life after death, even if it's just the survival of consciousness itself beyond my body. I, I don't, I've never really subscribed to the idea that consciousness is just a, a brain phenomenon. Partly because, you know, I've had my own experiences in which consciousness has seemed to stretch beyond that and to harmonize with the whole world. So, yeah, for me, it was also a relief when I, when I started to read about spirituality. I thought, wow, and mysticism. I thought, wow, this, you know, you know, I don't have to believe that materialism is the reality. And, um, yeah, there is a feeling that, you know, yeah, that it, it is somehow, it feels right. And I think one of the problems with materialism is that, you know, it's, it, it's helped to, you know, our culture is very shallow and consumerist. As you said before, people seek happiness from external sources. And, and materialism is partly to blame for that because it insists, it insists that, you know, this is all we have. So you may as well just have a good time and take as much as you can from the world. But essentially, you know, life is meaningless. You're just a genetic machine. There's no purpose apart from su to survive and reproduce. So what the hell, you know, just buy as many things as you can, just have as much fun as you can. So it's basically nihilistic. So there's the, I think there's, there is this kind of underlying nihilism in our culture. And even the environmental crisis is partly caused by materialism, yeah. if not largely caused by materialism, because we see nature as just a supply of resources to help our consumerism. We don't feel any sort of connection to nature or any sense of responsibility because it, you know, it's all just biological machines. You know, animals are not real, really beings. You know, nature is just... There for, our, there for us to abuse and exploit. So materialism has had a terrible effect on our culture, but I think more and more people are sensing that and they are moving beyond materialism. And so I find, I find it quite heartening actually that over the last 20 years, you know, I think materialism as a philosophy, it has begun to wane. It's still dominant, but more and more people, even in academia, mm. which is where I, you know, I'm, I'm partly based in the world of academia, more and more people are becoming open to non-materialist perspectives. And this, I like that you mentioned the environment because that's one huge, you know, huge byproduct of feeding the sentience of everything is like you're going to treat it so much differently than if you just see it as like a resource, as you say. Um, mm. I, I, There are many different areas that I wanted to... to to mention or, or briefly note this idea of like materialism being dogmatic you you also speak about scientism um and i feel that they're very closely linked could you maybe briefly explain scientism as a a kind of phenomenon in in the world of of knowledge scientism is it's a, a belief system which is derived from some of the findings of modern science but it's quite a kind of surreptitious belief system because a lot of people imbibe it without realizing. So I've met so many scientists who they're, they're just full of, you know, they're full of scientism. You know, they, they've just unconsciously <laughs> adopted the assumptions of materialism, but they're not aware of it. And, and they say, they say, they've said to me, you know, how can you call yourself a scientist when you believe in psi phenomena? Psi phenomena break the laws of science. You know, they, they just can't exist. And then I, maybe I even tell them that I'm open to the idea of an afterlife. And they, what? You know, this is ridiculous. How dare you? <laughs> How dare you? And I say, well, there's actually evidence. Uh, and they say, what? How can there be possibly be evidence? It can't possibly. So it's always like, it can't be true. It can't possibly be true. Mm -hmm. But they're just not willing to, to question their assumptions and, because they don't even realize that they have assumptions. Mm -hmm. but, I mean, but science, most of them are fairly nice people. Uh, so you, 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 I said most of them. <laughs> so you can actually, you know, I have, encouraged, I have encouraged quite a few 
scientists to to think about their own assumptions and then and, and, and they do sometimes reach a point where they they think to themselves yeah you know i have i have absorbed these assumptions and maybe i should question them i mean size is the big thing because i think you were alluding to this there is actually so much evidence for things like precognition and telepathy from really carefully controlled experiments and e even skeptics admit that there are positive findings but they try to explain them away in, in, in some fashion. But a lot of people are just not aware of the evidence. So when you actually present them with it, they, some, some people are open-minded enough to, to consider it, although others will just say, you know, I'm not even going to look at it. It, it mm. can't possibly be true. So, yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting. It's, it's, about, it's very similar to religious belief, but a lot, of, a lot of religious people will not consider any evidence that contrasts with their beliefs. You know, for example, if they don't believe in evolution, you know, they're just not willing to consider anything that contradicts their beliefs. Isn't it remarkable that even scientists can be unaware of the science of you know, these non-ordinary experiences that it's like the resistance that has to come from that, that, you know, outdated worldview, really. Um, is kind of not worth exploring for for some people let alone you know joe blogs they're not going to be privy mm. to, to the science of, of this kind of pan-spiritist worldview yeah um i i would really i would really like to look at um in in more detail the big uh, so we've got one huge assumption like consciousness being in the brain just resting on materialism and a lot of things that come from that, you know, the, with that, that assumption, the um, invalidity of, of like telepathy and, and stuff like that. Um, one thing though, that is exceptional, like when I just, when I really uncovered this stuff for me, just like transformed a lot is how much um, growing evidence and theories there are for, and you've mentioned this as well, consciousness being fundamental. And the link between that and also the discovery of quantum physics. Hmm. I, I talk about quantum physics to people a lot and they kind of glaze over and I, I think they think, what, why, why are you talking about quantum physics? What's going on? Um, but I love how you, you articulated it in, in spiritual science as well. This is a realm of science that really conflicts like the Newtonian <laughs> cause and effect worldview and explains so much of the human experience like synchronicity like telepathy like mm, you know mm. um could you talk to maybe some of the findings in quantum physics and the the origin of that and how that supports this this pan-spiritist uh, worldview it is interesting i think in, in physics there is this um there are two realms really you have the macro macro sorry macrocosmic world of newtonian physics where all the laws work very well and it, it explains um you know how the world works very very well but then you've got this you know microcosmic realm of quantum physics which in many ways contradicts the, the macrocosmic world but i think a lot of a lot of physicists they live in the the macrocosmic world and they kind of ignore the microcosmic microcosmic world or they explore it but don't consider the consequences because materialism the worldview of materialism only really functions in the macrocosmic world it doesn't function in the microcosmic world as soon as you delve into this world of quantum physics, then all the principles of materialism, they just seem to dissolve away. You know, everything literally dissolves away. You know, matter dissolves away into energy. And, you know, and the assumptions that, um, that entities exist in separation, which can't communicate with each other across distance, that falls away too, because particles, there, there have been um, experiments where particles are, are miles apart, but they still react as if they are connected they move in in parallel with each other if, as if they can sense each other's movements and quantum physics suggests that the the observer is of paramount importance you know, the, the behavior of particles is always affected by the observer's ex expectations or intentions so it's, it's a participatory what participatory world in which nothing is separate everything is interconnected and some quantum physicists, you know, speak in terms of a, a fundamental energy, a kind of fundamental oneness. That, that's why a lot of the original quantum physicists were very attracted by Eastern philosophies. Mm. 
Yeah, they're amazing. You know, there, there have been anthologies of early quantum physicists like Heisenberg, Niels Bohr, and they, they sound like they're just, uh, you know, they're, they're writing spiritual texts. You yeah. know, they, they speak about this fundamental oneness and how the world is a manifestation of something more fundamental. And, you know, you, you, you kind of think to yourself, you know, why don't, why don't some more scientists investigate this and realize the consequences of it, consequences of it? But of course, they don't want to because they have absorbed a particular belief system. And even within the field of science, they're reluctant to consider any findings which, which contradict that. So even some physicists now will say something like, well, you know, it all seems crazy, but we'll work out eventually. It will all become clear eventually, mm -hmm. but it won't. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it is crazy because, you know, the, the, uh, the macrocosmic world is not the world as it really is. It doesn't really represent res res reality. It's a kind of representation, a kind of manifestation of something deeper, you know, where different laws apply. Yeah, so, I mean, at the very least, quantum physics suggests that the world is infinitely stranger than it appears on the surface. And so, so when scientists say, this is the way things are, materialism explains the world, you know, at the very least you can say, that can't be the case because there is so much more to reality than we are aware of. There are so many strange phenomena which we can't, which we can't account for. And therefore we can't suddenly say, right, this is the way things are, we've worked it out. Because, you know, there's infinitely more than we are aware of. I really like in, in the book how you, you talk about one way of explaining away quantum physics is to say like, oh, it just applies to the, the infinitely small. But there's growing evidence with like quantum biology uh, you mentioned how uh, quantum physics can be involved in, in photosynthesis and also the uh, like kind of radar compass of, of migrating birds related to uh, quantum, like something in their eyes. That's right. So in their eyes and the Earth's magnetic field is like a quantum connection. Um, yeah. I, I, I want to be clear for those listening who um, maybe don't get the link fully and if I've not explained it for my personal link I, exactly what, what Steve's saying as well is what we're looking at is a scientific model of existence that points to inexplainable phenomena like um, non-locality atoms being connected over distance that contradicts these models that we have for me personally what this means is that we cannot just even, even if we're the most skeptical person in the world, we cannot rule out the non-ordinary experiences of spiritual awakening, of, of precognition, of life after death, because there's a like, wealth of scientific evidence that points to a worldview we don't quite understand, but one that is not material. And that for me is like, oof, that's, that's liberating. I think that can liberate us if we allow, allow ourselves to embrace yeah. it. Yeah, and it's important to note that it isn't flaky. It's not kind of new agey, fluffy stuff. It's real, really hard science, you know? Mm. Um, so it's, it's just a question of um, being aware of the evidence. And once you're aware of the evidence, then you realize there is a, there's a massive amount of justification for an alternative worldview. Well, I think it was um, Niels Bohr. I can't remember the exact quote, but he says, to understand quantum physics, you have to think in terms of poetry and um symbolism and myth like it's mm. almost like it, you get to that level of, of existence where you the logical mind can't comprehend yeah there's like a poetic quality to it that's right it's a bit like the uh, the koans in in zen buddhism the kind of riddles yeah. that don't make any sense and they're meant to kind of paralyze the rational mind it's a bit like that it doesn't make any sense but i think that's what we should expect and i i really dislike the arrogance of some scientists who who believe that we're kind of close to a final understanding of the universe and you know everything will fit together in this complete worldview of how the universe works we'll never get there you know we forget that we are we are basically animals mm. and every animal has a certain degree of awareness of reality you know a sheep has a certain degree of awareness of reality an ant has a certain degree of awareness of reality a bacteria an amoeba and so forth but why should we assume that our awareness is complete? You know, a sheep, maybe a sheep thinks its awareness is complete. <laughs> but, with, you know, that in theory, further down the line, 
in millions of years, there'll be other beings who are much more advanced than us with a much more intense awareness. But even they won't have a complete awareness, you know. So that I am, I'm always convinced that there are endless realms of reality beyond our awareness, you know, endless realms of phenomena, laws, forces, that we just, we don't have the capacity to be aware of them. Yeah, I think that's why that, the, the humility that a lot of spiritual practices encourage is so important like just accepting there's a lot we can't comprehend even scientifically and allowing that to be part of the mystery of life rather than a problem to solve almost (laughs) that's right yeah i mean it's um yeah it's quite humble to accept that there's this mystery and uh some people gain that awareness through taking psychedelics they uh they think wow you know reality is much more complex than i assumed you know there, there are these different realms there are these different phenomena which I never suspected before. So they, they gain a new sense of humility and also, also a, you know, a feeling of mystery, mm-hmm. you know, a feeling of wonder. One thing that really strikes me with your work is a message of hope. This conversation, I feel, was also a message of hope because it shows that there is a deeper meaning, a transcendent meaning to existence. It's not all just... It, it seems like as well as is the humility to say there's a lot we can't comprehend there's the ability to to connect to a nourishing benevolent something however you want to define that in spiritual terms or as consciousness but it feels like you know, the evidence from near-death experiences people were awakening through trauma you know I, i'm one of those people i've awakened through depression suicide spells psychosis into this wider more expansive reality in a way that I, I never thought would be possible so there's a real message of hope um, in your work that I really appreciate what would you to kind of build build on that like if, if there are people that are suffering now or if there are people who are I, I really I believe that everyone has that that thread of curiosity because I think it's innate I think the the kind of inclination to to seek the spiritual is innate If there are people that are skeptical or suffering and looking for some direction or some kind of North star, what, what would you say to, to those people? I would tell them that, um, first of all, their, their feelings and the view of the world that they have in their state of suffering is not the ultimate truth. In fact, it's only a kind of partial vision of things. And if they can gain a sense of connection um, and expansion, then they will, nat- they will connect to this naturally harmonious um, sense of being. And they will gain a, a sense of harmony within themselves. I think depression, I mean, I, I spent many years depressed myself you know, including to the point of often contemplating suicide. And for me, there was always a sense of constriction. I was, I was constricted within myself. Mm-hmm. I was confused and constricted. Partly it was because I didn't understand myself. Partly it was because I sensed that there was more to reality than the materialist belief system. But, you know, I couldn't accept that intellectually, even though I sensed it. So there was a kind of conflict inside me. But you know, I had these at the same time, I had these moments when my constriction would fade away and I'd feel connected to my surroundings. I'd be filled with a sense of harmony. And in those moments, I always sense that I was connecting to something more fundamental. I was going outside myself and becoming part of the world. So, so for me, it was a sense of separateness. I, I was getting too immersed in my own separateness. And I think maybe one of the most important things to remember is that separateness is an illusion. And in reality, when our minds become quiet, and then we naturally begin to participate in a much greater reality. So, I mean, it's very difficult. When 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 you're depressed, your mind is very active. It's often filled with these kind of scripts of negative thoughts, which are very difficult to transcend. The mind becomes so active so chaotic it's very difficult to to transcend but 
there are certain situations and certain activities which, which naturally have a mind quietening effect, like contact with nature. Exercise has a mind quietening effect. So I, I'd encourage people to, to seek out a situation or activity where your mind will naturally become quiet. For example, go for a walk in the countryside, go for a run or, or, or a swim, do some gardening, anything which involves contact with nature. Then your mind will become quieter. The script of, dep of uh, depressive thoughts will begin to fade away and, you, and you'll, you'll, you'll have an, there'll be an opening. There'll be a space in your mind. And through that space, you'll connect to a wider reality and a sense of harmony will naturally fill you because harmony is the essential reality of things. You know, I think one of the problems is that when you're depressed, you don't trust the world. You feel that there's something essentially negative about the world, but that's, that seems very true when you're, in, when you're depressed, but it's not actually true. The, the reality of things is that harmony is the essential nature of the world. You can trust the world. The world, crazy as it seems, the world is essentially benevolent. You know, there is a, yeah. an intensely benevolent quality to reality itself, to the universe itself. So we need to touch into that quality and we can because it's our natural being. You know, that, that, that feeling of harmony and benevolence is inside us too. It's the essence of everything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just a question really of transcending the ego mind and getting in touch with that natural harmony. You know, that's beautiful. I really appreciate you, you sharing that. And one thing that comes to mind, well, a few things that come to mind. One is, is this the responsibility of the ego and the intellect? I, my understanding is that the intellect, as you're, as you're talking to, shuts down a natural tendency to want to be connected to the harmonious, to want to feel that connection to everything. Um, and that is only the the mental activity and you know a lot of non-dual teachings talk to this as well it's the mental activity that creates the the separation and the the internalization of this this worldview is one thing that fuels that kind of denial intellectual denial uh one thing that came to mind when you were talking is something that's been present for me recently as a as an exploration which is this idea of it's too good to be true mm. And but I just had a deeper realization, like as I've grown, like uh, I've experienced things that then more expansive experiences become more plausible because of the base level that is, it expands. And I feel that for many people that this reality is too good to be true, but it's like understanding that if you believe something to be too good to be true, that's the belief. It's not the reality. It's like you, you, you're saying that's too good to be true as an intellectual thought, mm -hmm. right? Rather than actual direct experience, which I think psychedelics, you mentioned that psychedelic research, spontaneous awakenings are almost just direct contact with the too good to be true. <laughs> that makes yeah. sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I would say that the, the good is true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and that's one of the things that you realize when you have these experiences, you don't think, wow, this is too good to be true. You think, wow, this is, this is the way things are. This yeah, it feels so yeah. natural. It feels so right. Mm -hmm. If you, you think to yourself, why, why, am, I in, why am, am I not in the state all the time? It feels like the natural state that you should be in. And it is the natural state. It's just only the kind of the crazy ego mind that takes us away from that state. Yeah. It's, it, I, I think of it in terms of like trying to describe color to, to a blind person or someone who can't see. Hmm. It can hmm. feel... You know, I know a lot of a lot of people struggle sometimes with if people talk of these experiences, how do you understand? How do you comprehend that? Uh, because talking about an experience is already a translation, which is, you know, putting language to the ineffable. Hmm. Um, one, I, I'm aware we're coming towards the end of the discussion. It's been incredibly fruitful and, and um, I really appreciate you making the time to, to talk and uh, value You're it welcome. greatly. Um, what would you, because we've looked at this, this kind of flip side for people that are suffering, is there also anything that you would say to those who are starting to have expansive experiences that they're not making sense of? Is there anything in terms of reassurance or, or um, grounding that you could say to the people that are starting to awaken in that way? 
one of the issues I found is that because a lot of people have imbibed the materialist worldview, they don't trust the experiences that they sometimes they even pathologize them, you know, or they associate them with religion. I remember I, was, I did a talk a few years ago at a psychology group and I was talking about awakening experiences. And a woman came up to me at the end and said, oh, I'm an atheist, but I've, I've, had, I've had experiences like this. Is that possible? How can it be possible if I'm an atheist? And I said, well, it's nothing to do with religion. Yeah. <laughs> I said, of course it's possible. She was really relieved because there is this duality between materialism and any kind of anomalous experience. If you have anomalous experiences, you know, many people think that it means that you're entering this world of superstition and, and irrationality, but that's not the case. So I, I would encourage people to accept these experiences as normal and healthy, incredibly healthy, but, you know, and you don't need to explain them in terms of religion. You don't even need to explain them in terms of spirituality. You don't need to become a Buddhist or to study you know, the Kabbalah or the Sufi path. You may be inclined to, but the, but the experience itself is a natural psychological phenomenon. And as I, as I suggested before, it's actually a transcendence of a, an aberrational state of separation and discord, which is what we call the normal human state. So in these moments, you're actually becoming normal. You know, you're actually becoming what you should be <laughs> and what you are. Yeah. And you're, you're seeing reality as it is. So it's, it's an incredibly value experience, which, should, which you should treasure and, and try to cultivate because you can cultivate these experiences to some degree. Often they are accidental, but you, you can create the conditions in which they are likely to arise. And I know we, you know, we're at a time when we're, we're very much kind of in a, a fear, like collectively in a fear-based, um, at times it feels survivalist state in terms of, the, you know, the news and, and the way that the world is, is portrayed. Um, it does feel like we're at a time when, when we're actually evolving into higher awareness. At, at, you know, we talk about the, the flip side of suffering and joy. It's almost like the amplification of, of the, the separation is occurring at the same time as the awakening. And that's like a, a bridge mm. to cross. But ultimately, there is hope we're, we're moving towards something greater. I think so. I mean, even if you look into research, uh, there is evidence that... Um, you know, spiritual experiences are becoming um, a more frequently reported than they used to be. Um, in terms of cultural trends, interest in spiritual development or spiritual practices is, you know, one of the most dominant, prevalent trends of our time. It's increasing exponentially. And even in my own research, I've, I, you know, I've met countless people who've undergone the phenomenon that I call transformation through turmoil. who've undergone spiritual awakening in, in the midst of suffering. And I always have the, the impression that it's as if there is a, a new self, which is just waiting. It's, it's fully formed as a structure, just waiting for the opportunity to emerge. Mm. And it's almost as if it's kind of like a, an underlying, you know, it's, it's almost as if it's underlying the human race collectively, that there is this new self waiting to emerge in the whole human race. It's as if, you know, a new a new level of evolution is manifesting itself a new mm. level of consciousness is manifesting itself and um so you know despite all the the chaos and crisis in the world i'm still opt still optimistic because i think there is a wave of spiritual awakening happening collectively and i think the reason why there's this opposing trend you know of sort of increasing rigidity increasing nationalism patriarchy and so forth I think it's a, it's a resistance to the growing tide of growing tide of wakefulness. Mm -hmm. you know, wh whenever one trait is, is being taken over, it becomes solid and rigid to try to protect itself. It feels threatened. Yeah. So it, it tries to assert itself more strongly. So I think that's what's happening now. There is this wide rising tide of wakefulness in the world and the old values and the old egoic rigid consciousness is, is feeling threatened. It's trying to assert itself because it knows that it's dying. Mm. Like a collective ego death. That's almost. right. Yeah, yeah, it's in, and and you know, it's like a it's like a crazy dictator who knows that he's in danger of being deposed. <laughs> he's sort of lashing out and uh, he's killing all his enemies, and you know, he's, he's trying <laughs> to entrench. 
<laughs> yeah, he's because he's trying to entrench himself because he knows that he's losing, basically. Yeah. You you mentioned um, the word emergence, uh, and I really like that as a word. It's like we're going collectively almost. It's like as if we're facing a, a collective spiritual emergency. But of course, the the origin of that word, I think, there's a Chinese origin. Like it's the emergence of something new, in in that in that sense, and that's what you talk to. You know, it feels like. This is a necessary stage in the evolution of humanity, almost. It is necessary because, um, you know, I don't think we can survive in the old state of consciousness. I think the problems we face now are a direct result of the old state of consciousness. They are a direct result of the separate ego, mm-hmm. you know, and its detachment from nature and its detachment from the body as well. You know, so... Ecological catastrophe is the natural result of the isolated ego, which feels mm. detached from reality. And the only, really, the only, the only way for us to, to survive is to develop a new state of consciousness, to transcend separation, to feel our connection to nature and to other human beings, to move beyond group identity and nationalism and so forth, and to feel our innate connection, to experience that connection and to create a, a more harmonious world on the basis of that connection. Mm. Yeah, I, re- I really don't see any other future for the human race unless we transcend ego separateness and yeah. become aware of our innate connection. Yeah, it's a time for a necessary shift of consciousness. Yeah, and that, that's why it's happening now. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I talk a lot about um, individual transformations in the midst of suffering and turmoil. And that's what's happening collectively. I yeah. think we are going through a collective transformation in the midst of collective turmoil and, and suffering. And, and also, I talk a lot about how an encounter with death can bring about transformation when people are diagnosed with cancer or when they're close to death through addiction. Yeah. That often happens. And yeah, you could say that collectively, the same thing is happening now. We are threatened with our own death as a species we're already causing the death of thousands of other species millions of other species yeah so you know our collective transformation is coming about as a result of that as well that's such a a fascinating way of of viewing like the current times you know it's like almost it could have um catalyzed evolution of consciousness because the maybe even the earth's consciousness this kind of gaia consciousness is is activating higher levels of um yeah, connection and empathy. Possibly. <clears throat> yeah, it, it could be a kind of evolutionary mechanism. Yeah. Steve, it, it's, been a, it's been a pleasure. It's really been a pleasure talking to you and, and I value your time. I value the, the work that you're doing and the perspective that you're bringing, um, not only to, to science, not only to psychology, but to the, the value in people's lives that are going through, through tough times and, and looking for a, a different map. So I really appreciate you taking time to be on the show. No problem. Thanks to you, Raheem. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you.